All of us are back from our summer vacations. We talk about the cars that we drove, both in the United States and overseas. Plus, the Toyota CHR. Is it an SUV or a hatchback? And finally, we get some viewer questions, one of which got us out on the test track to find out the answer. Next on Talking Cars. Hey everyone, welcome back to Talking Cars. I'm John Lincove. I'm Jake Fisher. I'm Gabe Schenhauer. And we're at the end of the summer, rolling into fall. You can see I'm starting my, my little fall beard for warmth here because I don't have as much up top. Um, but, you know, at the end of the summer, everyone goes away. And I know from talking around the office, Jake, you took the biggest trip probably of all of us. Tell us about it. Well, I, I, I shaved my beard, all, beard already, so the, the vacation beard's done. But, uh, yeah, we went to uh, China and Japan. Um, so we kind of took a, a three-weeker and um, spent a lot of time kind of, uh, you know, I mean, I'm always looking at the cars, too, wherever I go. Sure, sure. And uh, when we went to Japan, we actually – we landed in Tokyo, and I did exactly what everyone says not to do, which is rent a car in Tokyo because they got a great public transportation system. And there's they like bullet everyone's trains. on the road. You see those like traffic lights change, and like it's a mass of people. You know, like <laughs> how do you drive? People. And it was a blast. I wouldn't recommend to a lot of people to go and rent a car in Tokyo, but well, it you're was, an expert. It, I'm whatever, but. <laughs> um, you know, after I, you know, after the third day, you know, I figured out which side of the road to stay on, which was which was helpful, but. Um, yeah, we wound up running a car in Tokyo and drove clear across the country to Kyoto and Nara and all that good stuff. But um, driving in Japan, I mean, just it was just one. It was really cool, right? It was, it was really quite a challenge. But it's amazing if you look at the auto industry and how it's evolved completely different in Japan than in America. I mean, in America you see tons of Japanese cars, but these aren't the Japanese cars you see in Japan. So they what they Americanized cars here and yeah, like, I mean, mini I mean, cars and. Well, well, I mean, look, the cars we have in your, over here, right? I mean, Camry, Accord. I mean, they're all built in America, right? I mean, these are yeah. American cars. Yeah. And they're big. And they're big. But, you know, first of all, you got the little tiny cars there, right? You got the um, 600 cc like, little cars. And these are, you know, they're not, like, smart cars. They're four-door, like, little cube boxes, right? We, we had the, with the Scion uh, XB, you know, that was here. That's huge compared to what everyone's driving over there. You know, very small, very efficient um, there's reasons why they do it. They get tax incentives and well, all these what's, things. Yeah, what size the engines and, and six, such? I think they're it. like 600cc and they have to be like a maximum of like yeah, 63 horsepower. Yeah, a tax horsepower. limit or something. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, in, in, a, in a country where, you know, you know, a cord might be $35,000, these are $10,000 cars. Right. And, you know, they're great driving around little little streets. But But that's, those I've heard of, what I didn't realize was just how, Look, we get minivans here, and we always talk about minivans, and they're not cool, but they're really useful vehicles. They get minivans of every size. So even U.S. size, like you know the Sienna. Sure, you'll, you'll see a, you'll see a Sienna, Otis you'll see Sienna. an Odyssey, yep. but then you have like these you know kind of Civic footprint minivans. You got smaller minivans, and they're all these cubes with tons of room inside. So they're efficient. They're not just tiny little cars. Right, exactly. So almost like everything from a little tiny box to the big minivans and bigger than that. And this is what really most people are driving now. So narrow, tall boxes. Right. With tons of room inside. Um, and it's just so efficient. And then you get back to America and it's like everyone's driving a pickup truck, you know, which is like so inefficient. Well, everyone's going to say though, you know, Gabe, correct me. It, well, there's tiny little things and tiny little engines. And you can't put stuff in them, and you can't get out of your own way. You know what about that? You know, can't, how how do they? How did the rental car work? How did that go with a family of four and your stuff? Well, I mean, it was fine. I, I drove a uh, Toyota Ractus, which was like you know, you go to the, the rental counter, right? And they're like, you know, oh, you have a Chrysler 200, and you're always trying to like you know upgrade, get out of that, get out of it. They're like, you have a Toyota Ractus. I'm like. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm like, should I get out of it? Is it good? I look at the picture. It kind of looks like a Toyota Yaris, but it's got a larger Yaris. And actually, it was fine. There's plenty of room in it. It's kind of like a little, you know, halfway between like a little minivan or something like that. And it was, it was, it was fine. So, so Gabe, what about your trip? You know, what? How far did you go? And then okay, what about so, the, some of the cars over? Well, first, trip? I uh, went to Ohio, bringing um, my son to uh, back to school. So we took the uh, Volkswagen Atlas, uh, which uh, turned out to be a wonderful road trip uh, car. Well, speaking of a giant box, Good. like versus the, the little Japanese, yeah. <laughs> it's an immense box, isn't so, it? So nine-hour drive, you know, 600 miles something, and, uh, you know, good seat, uh, good infotainment system, tons of room. I, I, my son took drum 
kit and a guitar mm-hmm. and his Xbox and just about you know, just like a move. And uh, a nice 450 mile uh, range on the gas tank. So a wonderful car. I mean, uh, for a road trip, uh, can't beat that. Uh, so that's one trip. Yep. Uh, I also took another trip uh, to Israel. And, uh, Not unlike- in the Atlas. Not in the Atlas. <laughs> yeah. okay. Just uh, covered about half the Atlas. So uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, unlike other times when I rent cars, uh, you know, staying a few days in Tel Aviv, there was no point uh, renting a car because, you know, traffic and parking is such a nightmare. So I just used taxis and uh, nothing wrong with using Mercedes C-Class all the time, you know, going from one place to another, saving, you know, the, the hassle so, of parking. and. So they went from E's all. before. Like, historically, they were E's and now they've, the C is big enough for taxi use. Yeah, C class is, is a big enough for a taxi. You know, Slum uh, a yeah. more yeah. often than I mean, they're not all C classes, but you know, <laughs> more often than not, you get a C class. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you get a Skoda or some other Renault or or such. Mm, a comparable uh, size. I also uh, I borrowed my sister's Hyundai Tucson once, and I uh, parked it in the parking garage. And um, at the end, you know, after a few hours, I come back to find it, and lo and behold. I don't know which car it is because apparently like every fourth car there is a Hyundai Tucson. Front wheel drive or all wheel drive? Front wheel drive, drive. mostly, yeah. And uh, I didn't remember the license plate. I didn't really remember what color it was. (laughs) So I'm like walking with the key. Beep in the air. Yeah, Yeah, beep in the air, yeah. Also, a lot of times people ask me, um, are there any American cars there? So um, uh, just... uh, not counting uh, Ford of Europe products like uh, Focus and uh, Fiesta and uh, and Chevrolets that are sourced from South Korea, real American cars, Jeep Grand Cherokee seems like to be like the most popular American car there. Really? Yeah, mm-hmm. so just yeah. super capable off road. Um, yeah, it's not really about the off road, even though people do that sure. uh, there. But uh, it just uh, seems like a. You know, it's considered like a, a cool car, you know. I was shocked how many Subarus were in Israel when I visited a number of years ago now, eight years ago. Um, I just didn't think like, oh, all-wheel drive only car is necessary. But, yeah, a ton of Subarus. Yeah, tons of Subarus, uh, tons of – I mean, the Koreans, really, Hyundai and Kia are like uh, – just like pretty much took over the, a large section of the market. Mm. Also, I was surprised how the Toyota CHR – I mean, you hardly see a CHR here. I saw like tons of them there. Yeah, most of them hybrids, but yeah. uh, I we mean, saw we saw really a bunch of CHRs in Japan too, and they were all hybrids. Um, yeah, unfortunately, we don't get those yet. Well, here. you know, yeah. kind of rolls into what we're testing. You know, because we have a CHR in test, and again, just, just finished testing. Just finished. It. It's yeah. front wheel drive only in the United States, whereas overseas you can get it all wheel drive, drive and hybrid. And hybrid, yeah. Yeah, it just seems like a fashion statement. You know, you see it parked <laughs> like out outside every like hip restaurant and bar, and uh, yeah, it's a like a young. Uh, kind of hip kind of car it's, <laughs> it's definitely uh, polarizing no, nobody really cares that the visibility is awful that uh <laughs> it's uh compromised it kids like, in the back or something like that right i mean it looks like a coupe uh mm-hmm. so it, it's high riding so it's kind of fashionable when we first got our chr we posted pictures of it on our facebook page and uh because we reports cars facebook page and i was surprised how many people we're posting is like that is the ugliest thing i've ever seen <laughs> well sure you know and it, but it's 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 hitting a t- target demographic apparently, like you said. It's a stylish fashionista, if you will, right, looking right, kind right. of car. You wear the man bun because it ticks off other people. You, know? it's like, <laughs> you drive the CHR because it annoys other people. Exactly. Is that what you're saying? Maybe. Yeah, it's it's it's. I'm, I was surprised actually how how big it is inside for what it is. It's still a tiny car, and it's still the polarizing styling, mm-hmm. and still baffling about it not having all-wheel drive in the United States. I mean, I understand yeah. it's going to be heavier and all that, but still, it, it just doesn't seem to fit. Well, we were just talking about it uh, earlier today. We were talking about, you know, where do we put in the ratings, right? Because it's like kind of like a small subcompact SUV, but you know what? Our definition of a subcompact SUV is an all-wheel drive, sure. you know, thing, and you can't even get it on that. Yeah, so people, now is it really more like a Kia Soul, you know, which yeah, is just I mean, a small potential car. buyers are going to perceive it as a competitor to a Honda HRV and a Mazda CX-3 and and then uh, Subaru Crosstrek. Right. But I think knowing that it doesn't have all-wheel drive uh, should take it uh, out of contention for a lot of people, especially in the snow belt. Right. You know, as far as all-wheel drive capability, without having that, you know, it's going to be like the bottom of the smile, the southern tier states, you know, where you'd buy a front-wheel drive HRV or, you know, one of the front-wheel drive CX-3, Mazda CX-3. 
Yeah, and, and a lot of these uh, small SUVs are sold as front-wheel drive only. I mean, sure. more than by fifty-five percent of them. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, California, Texas, Florida. I mean, even bigger SUVs are sold are sold as front-wheel drive. Sure, sure. Well, we'll have ratings on that later. The trip I took was up to Boston into Portland, and I used the the uh, excuse me the Chrysler Pacifica hybrid uh, minivan, and I gotta tell you, it's Fantastic vehicle. I was very impressed. I got 28 miles per gallon or so on the trip. It wow. indicated, you know, I didn't fuel meter it. I, I didn't measure it out exactly, but that's what it said. So it was pretty good for people, all our stuff. Were you um, able to plug in anywhere? So I wasn't able to plug in because where we were parking, it was in hotels. And mm. I wasn't dragging it out <clears throat> into Boston where there would be some plentiful charging. Um, and then a couple of places we went in Portland, uh, some breweries, because that's become my thing after Dave Abrams has uh, introduced me to the <laughs> to the world of craft beer. Um, and your kids are old enough. Uh, to, to at least hang out at the brewery. They're, they're old enough for that. Um, and then a couple other places. They just didn't have, have charging stations, which is a disappointment. But it was great. It was a great vehicle. But we were talking about the entertainment factor. I mean, ours has the screens in the second mm-hmm. row, individual screens for the kids, and they have games on it. And they also have, you know, the video screen where you can pop it a CD in the front. The kids have headphones. I liked it a lot, um, but you had a point where you were saying, why well, okay, not just so get an just, iPad? Just get an iPad. And it's like, look, I mean, the Pacific, it's, it's pretty cool. It's got a lot of features on it. There's a lot of like, I mean, it's almost like being in a, in, in a plane, right? I mean, yeah. you got like all these different options. You can yeah, see there's games and all kinds of You can of see stuff. where you are on your trip. And right. the Honda Odyssey has very similar features too. I mean, it's very, very cool. I like the license plate game. License plate game, right? I, I couldn't mean, get my kids to do this. Yeah, um, get the kids some iPads, or not even the iPads. Like, there's cheaper alternatives too to some a, basic to a tablet. tablets that you could just put some and, videos. And on. now you got videos, you got games. They're upgradable. I mean, the stuff that's on these minivans is great. But yep. you know what? In five years, I mean, it becomes old tech. Oh my god! I mean, yeah. what's going to be around in five years when it comes to that technology? So, and, and plus, you're not reaching for it. You know, it's like right there for you, with you know. Them. So, so. That was probably, it was great to have them in their own universe. I could take the DVD out and just be like, no, you're done. Let's interact. Right. You know, look out the window. Do what I did when I was little. Stare out the window <laughs> and be bored, for God's sakes. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it was very nice to put the, DV- the video in. They were there. They can control it themselves. Um, the iPad, you could pass back and forth. They did run into a lot of trouble <clears> at times. Like, well, it's not working here. Oh, wait, it's pause. And then my daughter, of course, you know, so she's got the headphones on and my son's got the headphones on and they're like screaming at each other because <laughs> it's already right, loud, right. telling him what to do. And I'm driving like, well, help us. And you know, we're not going to climb into the back during that. So yeah, the, the, the <clears> iPad, you pass yeah. back and forth. Also, the one thing I found was that, you know, my kids are seven and a half and five and a half. So to access the screen on the back of the seat, they have to pull up a little bit. Which then right. makes it difficult to reach for them as little kids to reach back and buckle themselves in. They can buckle themselves in. They're capable of that. But the reach was so hard that then we had to, you know, if they became unbuckled or even getting them in and out, it was an, just an extra step. So yeah. it's just one of those things where if they <clears throat> sat further back, they were able to buckle themselves and then have an iPad. We there, don't have them for the there, kids. There's a bunch of issues there. I mean, like I, I did a trip to uh, Nova Scotia, actually, based on your recommendation about – 10 years ago, and I took a minivan, and again, yeah. minivan, great, you sure. know, but I had a three-year-old kid at the time, and now you're dealing with DVDs, you know, and you're like, they're too little to put the DVD in themselves, but then you're futzing with the DVD when you're trying to drive the car, it's like, ah, oh, it's, it's done, you well, know? the headphones are on little and kids the headphones don't always are, fit. So it's just like, you know, and again, it's like the upgradability. It's like the 10-year-old system that yeah. was in that Sienna that I drove, you know, it's just, it's nothing compared to what's the technology. I mean... Was there even iPads around, you know, 10 years ago? Not so much. Yeah. Well, you know, I think we'd love to hear, you know, in the comments what people do for their road trips, you know. Yeah. So, you know, tell us what types of things you guys do, you know, to keep the kids occupied. I mean, you know, maybe it's just, you know, if I have to stop this car, I'll, I'll, you're, I'll tell you're you in what, I, what I've been doing is that audiobooks, you know, that get us all involved and it was, it was really fun. What about the, the older teenager? Did you guys sit in silence well, and he was on his phone the whole time? No, actually, we did the old-fashioned way. We made up um, games, interactive games, without any electronics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Wow. But, uh, yeah. Old school. I was uh, old school, and you know, <laughs> that was years ago, because you know, my kids are yeah, you know, in, in college. But anyway, as an aside, I'll say the Pacifica Hybrid, I think actually that is FCA's best car right now. Oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah. It it definitely is. It's a really it nice definitely car. Is. It's yeah. about the only thing is the weird beeping when you raise and lower the tailgate. It's just an, an odd beep. But aside from that, and it's always hard to find that button. It's so conventional. 
across the industry to have it up top on the door. So reaching for that, I always I always miss it. Um, aside from that, it's great. And the seats, the second row seats are great in the hybrid because they're more padded, a little more plush. Hard to get no a, stow and go. So right, no stow and that, go. They don't fold on the floor. Not so thin. Um, hard to get booster seats to sit to position. The kids are always a little off center. Um, because they're very bolstered, but they're super comfortable. But, but it's like, you know, again, it's like we, we've talked about this a long time. It's like minivan and hybrid. You know, I mean, again, you, you get hybrid. It's very, you know, oh, yeah. practical and fuel efficient and whatever. I mean, Prius is the, you know, the the transportation pod. You know, you don't get it because it's really fun to drive. You right. get it because it does the job. The and same thing with minivan. Thing. Minivans are sensible. It's like it's the, you know, the all the stars align for sensibility. And but it's nothing, you know, going back to Japan. I mean, I was in Tokyo about 11 years ago, and guess what they had there? Hybrid minivans mm-hmm. all the way back then. You yeah. know, Toyota had a smaller minivan, but a hybrid. And, you know, it's just like, you know, finally we're getting this stuff. Right. When well, it works perfectly for mom mobile or even stay at home dad mobile <clears throat> for driving around town. You know, you're, if you're shuttling around town, you could be on, on, on the electric power almost all day. You know, you get, it, about, it, you get about 20 something, 30, 30 miles, and that that's great. You know, here and there, shuttle back and forth, school activities. So, yeah, you really get a lot of benefits. It's impressive from that. how yeah. much battery. I mean, not, not to, I mean, it's funny that they mark it as the hybrid minivan. It's, it's a plug in with a lot of capacity. I mean, 30 miles on the plug in portion is mm-hmm. not chump change. And that's pretty, yeah, pretty, pretty impressive. Pretty healthy. Well, speaking of, uh, you know, little boxes and minivans, I mean, there was other news, which is the, uh, the Volkswagen microbuses finally returning after how many years which, of which auto version? Shows? Which version are we on now? Right? I mean, it's been years that they've been showing concepts of right. this, and everyone's like, yes, bring back the microbus, you know, because, you know, the old microbuses are worth like hundreds of thousands of dollars now. Yeah, and they're all over Portland, Maine, I'll tell you. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they have the monopoly they on they them. They do, they do. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's really interesting where this, it's electric. I mean, again, practicality. It's a small box, which yep. is, you know, the hot sides in Japan, but we really haven't seen that here. And they've got the opportunity to kind of make it cool. Um, I mean, I'm, you know, it's still a couple of years away, but I'm pretty excited, you know, that we will buy one and we will go and test this. And they've got, yep. they've got the opportunity to actually have a lot of battery, you know, in that platform. Yeah. Sort yeah. of like a, the flat floor skateboard thing that right. GM had years ago with, with right, their right. hydrogen. Yeah. Things. Similar but idea. Yeah. 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 Um, everything in Volkswagen is going to be electric now because the diesel. Diesel's is dead. dead. <laughs> right. Yeah. Diesel gate, a lot of, of uh, money they have to put into electrification, um, you know, for California, for the rest of the country. But that's, that's where their fleet's going, right? We'll have to figure out which category to put the, the microbus in. <laughs> if it's all-wheel drive or front-wheel drive. We'll have to well, this is, I don't know. But, you know, talking about some, some testing and testing the microbus brings us into a couple questions that we got. Um, the first, uh, one of our viewers says, again, I hear you all mention stopping distances, but why don't you review vi- your review videos ever mention numbers for horsepower, torque, braking distance, zero to 60 times, et cetera, because that's the important information. Um, well, it's real simple to really answer that. It's why this podcast isn't brought to you by a food company and a manufacturer and, you know, six other, you know, commercials for other shows. It's because we have a, a paywall system. So we do put out a lot of information on the on talking cars. Uh, we put out information on consumerreports.org and, and for free. But a lot of our testing data is behind the paywall and, and, because and that's we, how we generate revenue. And we do have videos that do have information like zero to 60 and breaking distance, all that stuff. But it's... It's behind the table. Exactly. So we'd have two versions of, and I guess that's, maybe that's not always as clear as it should be, but you know, a lot of the videos that you were looking at and, on YouTube or whatnot, those aren't our test videos. We have much more comprehensive videos for paying subscribers. And, and on consumerreports.org, you can sort and compare vi- vehicles across that realm. Yeah. So you're going to see how they all each perform against and, each other and, in those. And honestly, those. probably the biggest thing is reliability, mm-hmm. you know, and you'll notice if you look at those, the videos, we don't, necessarily tell you how reliable it is and that's right. such an important thing um so that's all, all so there there's a the ton of off. premium yep. content that's available for subscribers so the second question actually you know got us actually actually putting on our thinking caps and not just talking about it question person asks wondering if you could put this question in the next talking cars episode is it more fuel efficient to put an automatic car into neutral at long red lights i figure that holding back the crawl is wasting energy i.e gas and there are also fewer vibrations in neutral as well or will going back and forth in the uh, transmission cause damage? So, Gabe, would it hurt the vehicle to do that? So, uh, there is conventional wisdom that uh, every neutral to drive is going to uh, take some away from the life of the transmission. I, it's, it's, I don't know. Um, according to 
experts, transmission experts at manufacturers. Okay. There is no, uh, shouldn't be any concern about wear and tear. Actually, would it do any saving? Would it give you any savings? You know, is it is it like stop start technology or is it just like, you know, you're wasting a lot of time? Well, I mean, so so we, we kind of huddled about this and we didn't know. I, I, I really don't. And I understand what he's asking, right? I mean, when you're when you're stopped, you know, you hear kind of like, you know, and all of a sudden you put in neutral or you put in park and all of a sudden. The engine revs drop a little sometimes bit. Sometimes the engine revs change yeah. a little bit, but it almost sounds like more relaxed and you get that rid of the vibration. I didn't know. I kind of, my guess was it wouldn't make any difference, but we decided to test it. So we have the equipment to actually measure how many cc's of fuel that the uh, the cars are being uh, uh, using every, every every minute or a time. So we decided to try it out. So we actually took our uh, our Volkswagen Tiguan, which we were testing at the time. We had it outfitted with a fuel rig. Right, so we, it's something we do with our te- all test cars. Exactly. We do our fuel economy tests. So we splice it to the fuel line. We actually measure the, the flow rate of fuel. And it's just an easy enough test to do. So, we, so I put the car into uh, drive. Foot on the brake. Actually, I had to shut off the uh, the automatic engine shut off. Stop start. Stop start because yep. it was it, so I disabled that. Also turned off the uh, air conditioning. So just just to make it consistent, sure. Because air conditioning will go on. And I ran it for a minute in drive, popped it into neutral, ran it for a minute, and um, there was a marked change. How much? Uh, so so it was the numbers were it was eighteen point. Six or around my 18 and a half cc's of fuel that we used in a minute when it was in drive that dropped to down to 13. So what does that put into like dollars and cents terms? So? Well, in dollars and cents, I mean, you know, in a minute you're saving about a half a half a penny. Okay. You know, I mean that's the roughly the numbers, but it is a difference. So sure. I mean, you know, to, to, is a good Use question. Use it as you wish. You know, <laughs> Use yeah. it as you wish. I mean, whether or not it's worth it. I mean, obviously, a lot of new cars have start stop. That'll you know, instead of cutting down the fuel use 30%, it'll cut it down a lot more than that. It'll save you a lot more. Um, right, right. And, and honestly, it was a really good question. I mean, we love getting questions like this because sometimes there's questions that we could actually, we could answer. Right. And there isn't a whole lot of people that have uh, fuel rigs on vehicles where we could actually uh, get to the answer of these things. Well, so, certainly, you know. So we could do a test like this. And it's also not a vehicle that's prepped by anybody. Like, you know, we, we have that technology, like you said, and we <clears> have a safe place to do it. And yeah, I mean, I mean, look, I mean, a lot of cars have the uh, the fuel economy, uh, you know, gauge, the gauge or you could reset it. You, you couldn't figure that out there. So, right. so that, that was that was fun. On that note, this wraps it up for this episode of Talking Cars. If you want more information on anything that we've talked about, check out the show notes below. Thanks and see you next time.